Good evening. <laughs> welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us by YouTube and C-SPAN this evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States. I speak to you tonight, as I have many times, from the William G. McGowan Theater in the National Archives Building in downtown Washington. This theater was built a decade ago with a gift to the Foundation for the National Archives from the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, Inc., which is also generously supporting tonight's program. It's fitting that we take time this evening to remember Sue Jin McGowan, who passed away in September. In addition to helping build this exceptional venue, the generosity of the Sue and William G. McGowan Charitable Fund allows us to host two McGowan forums each year, one on women in leadership and this one on communications, as well as numerous lectures, panels, film screenings, and book talks that bring to life some of the billions of records in the National Archives holdings. Before the McGowan Theater was built, visitors could come and see the Charters of Freedom, but there was no opportunity to engage them in a conversation about democracy and the incredible accomplishments of the founders in creating this great nation. Now people from all over the world can participate in events such as this where we hear from individuals who were part of some of the most pivotal moments in American history. Through the McGowan Theater and the support of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, we have this ability to come together and share stories preserved and protected in the National Archives to ensure that these important moments are never forgotten. This is truly a gift to the nation and to the world. Our guests for tonight's program, former presidential press secretaries, all had the delicate duty of communicating the views of the President of the United States. And if that wasn't enough, what they said was parsed over and over for further clues into the thinking of their bosses in the Oval Office. I'm sure tonight we're going to hear some real war stories. The records of their press briefings for President Ford, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton now reside in the respective presidential libraries, which are part of the National Archives. Presidential press conference transcripts are also printed in the public papers of the president, which is also published by the National Archives. Records of President Obama's press conferences are also in his public papers, and his press office's records will go to his presidential library when he leaves office. But before we move on to tonight's program, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow at noon, we'll welcome Admiral James G. Stravitas, the first admiral to command NATO in Europe, who will discuss his book, The Accidental Admiral, A Sailor Takes Command at NATO. The book looks at the challenges of directing NATO operations, cyber threats, and piracy. And the next Thursday, November 20th at noon, we'll welcome Kevin Gover, director of the National Museum of, American Indian, in, of the American Indian, and Suzanne Harjo, guest curator of the exhibit Nation to Nation, Treaties Between the United States and American Indians. The National Archives is loaning the treaties for the multi-year exhibit. If you want to know more about these and all of our upcoming events and public programs, please refer to our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it in the regular mail or by email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports all of our work, especially in education and outreach programs. And there are applications for membership in the lobby also. And it's a little secret that I, I keep telling people, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the Foundation for the National Archives. And now, speaking of the foundation, it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Alelia Bundles, chair and president of the Foundation for the National Archives. Thank you, David. I love seeing a full house, so welcome this evening. And thank you, David. And thank all of you for being here this evening for the McGowan um, Forum on Communications. I know you are all eager to hear our wonderful panel, uh, but please indulge me for just a few minutes uh, while I talk to you about a major milestone for the National Archives Museum. Ten years ago this fall, 
the William G. McGowan Theater, where we are seated, opened its doors to the public. Sue Jen McGowan, a passionate and visionary member of the Foundation for the National Archives Board, believed that this was a space that could bring people together to talk about extraordinary moments in American history. She named the theater for her late husband, Bill McGowan, who was a communications pioneer and founder of MCI. Bill believed strongly in the importance of open dialogue and was an enthusiastic lover of history. Here in the theater named for him, we celebrate those who have changed the landscape of our country and whose legacies are preserved in the holdings of the National Archives. And as David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States mentioned, you can become a member of the National Archives. You'll be on our mailing list. You'll get to know about all of these events. You may even get a reserved seat. So we know that, that's, we, know that we have a waiting line outside. Uh, and you can learn more about us at archivesfoundation.org. I'd like to tell you that just two weeks ago on this stage, we gave the Foundation's highest honor, uh, the Records of Achievement Award, to Robert Etzel, who brought the incredible story of the Monuments Men, the men who served in World War II, uh, out to the, into the open to the archives through his books and through that movie starring George Clooney. This past summer, we hosted a panel of civil rights leaders as part of the March on Washington Film Festival with a very interesting panel that included um, Dan Rather, Charlene Hunter Galt, Sharon Malone, and Peggy Wallace, the daughter of George Wallace. It was an electric evening. These are just a few of the things that we do along with the McGowan Forum in the spring, which features women. Last year, there were women from Congress, from Nancy Pelosi to Carol Mosley Braun. And so we hope that you will want to come back for our remarkable programs. Uh, and each year, we thank Sue Jen McGowan and the support of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. But I have just some sad news to share with you. Uh, just within the last month, we lost Sue McGowan. She passed away suddenly, unexpectedly. We greatly miss her humor and grace, but know that she will always be present here through her gift to us all, this beautiful theater and these extraordinary programs that bring the story of America to life. Tonight, we are privileged to have with us Ana Chavez, whose late husband, Gene Eidenberg, was our board member who uh, helped bring the McGowan Fund to become our friend, and also Diana Spencer, the Executive Director of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, and Marianne Brand, a close friend of Sue's and a trustee of the fund. It's my pleasure to welcome Marianne to the stage. Good evening. Uh, Bill McGowan was actually my uncle as well, so Sue was my aunt as well. Um, welcome to the 10th Annual William G. McGowan Forum on Communications, Technology, and Government. Every year, we eagerly await the theme for this treasured annual event, and our program this evening, White House press secretaries, are sure to become a favorite. The press secretary must be responsive, credible, unruffled, and accurate while communicating on behalf of the Oval Office to an often combative and highly intelligent press corps. This hot seat job demands a cool head. In the early years of the US presidency, there was a casual, congenial relationship between the Oval Office and the reporters who dropped by to chat. There were no press briefings or formalized encounters between the president and the press. Over the decades, the US population expanded. The number of magazines and newspapers exploded and the press secretary assumed a vital role, providing essential information while still protecting the president. At the first press conference following President Eisenhower's inauguration in January 1953, Ike's press secretary, James Haggerty, a former New York Times reporter, announced, I'm here to help you get the news, but I'm also here to work for one man who happens to be the president. I will do that to the best of my ability. Each of our panelists tonight demonstrated a remarkable ability to walk that fine line between candor and containment. They are Mike McCurry, press secretary to President Clinton, Marlon Fitzwater, 
press secretary to Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H. Bush, Robert Gibbs, President Obama's former press secretary, and Ron Neeson, press, Sec press secretary to President Ford. This program is presented in partnership with the National Archives Foundation and is supported by the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. The McGowan Fund was established in 1993 to honor the values and preserve the legacy of William G. McGowan, MCI founder and CEO, who had died the previous year. Spearheading the new fund was Bill's widow, Sue Jin McGowan, who has said, I have a commitment to giving back and contributing time and resources to philanthropic causes. We were shocked and saddened when Sue passed away suddenly on September 26th this year after suffering a stroke three days earlier in her Chicago headquarters. A global business leader with a deep commitment to immigration reform and to supporting the underserved and less fortunate, Sue combined ethical concerns with a fierce drive to succeed. Described as one of Chicago's most powerful businesswomen, she devoted time and resources to charitable organizations in Chicago. Sue also served on the board of the National Archives Foundation and loved working with this dedicated and talented board. Sue's spirit infuses the McGowan Fund as we move forward. Since its inception, the fund has gifted over $120 million to effective locally-based organizations in the areas of education, health and medical research, and community needs. These grants seed success for thousands of deserving individuals across America who would have fallen through holes in the safety net without the fund's support of their local nonprofit providers. Sue always insisted that grantees demonstrate their ability to effectively promote important solutions to societal problems. That leadership has served us well. In 2003, Jean Eidenberg, a former member of the McGowan Fund, came to us with a fantastic idea for the fund to partner with the National Archives to develop this theater where we gather tonight. Soon after, we established this annual fall forum to spotlight key topics in commerce, technology, and government in Bill McGowan's honor. In 2008, at Sue's urging, we added an annual spring forum on women in leadership, which focuses on women in key roles in business and leadership. What links the McGowan Fund to this theater and the ongoing forum series? Our benefactor, Bill McGowan, loved history. He loved movies, and he loved open and freewheeling debate on the great issues of the day. It is fitting that a theater created in his memory provides free public screenings of provocative documentaries, as well as dynamic conversations about vital topics. There's another connection as well. Bill cherished democracy backed by the rule of law. Only in a democracy could MCI, a small phone company from St. Louis, have prevailed in legal and regulatory battles against AT&T, a mammoth corporation with a lock on the US phone service delivery channels. MCI's victory over AT&T after nearly a decade of legal battles broke the monopoly and opened our phone service to healthy competition. Consumers benefited, and the way was cleared to advances in communication technology. Like Bill, Sue was a lifetime learner and zealous researcher. She welcomed debate and the exchange of ideas, and continually updated her company's operations with new practices that made sense. Sue looked forward each year to both fall and spring forums here at the National Archives. The Spring Women's Forum reflects Sue's lifelong commitment to empowering women and giving them a full place at the table. At her funeral, John Rowe, the chairman emeritus of Exelon Corporation, described Sue as a role model for women, Chinese Americans, and anyone who wanted to start a business. The founder of Chicago's Women Business Development Center noted that during her career, Sue faced sexism, racism, and discrimination, and always overcame it because she looked at everything as a challenge not as a barrier. I want to close by saying how grateful we are for our partnership with the National Archives Foundation. Everyone here is committed to delivering thoughtful, relevant, and extraordinary programs in the theater and is open to ideas from the McGowan Fund. 
Thank you for joining us this evening as we salute the generosity and amazing entrepreneurial spirit of Sue Jin McGowan and Bill McGowan. Soon our eclectic panel of insiders will take us behind the scenes at White House press briefings. I can't wait. Thank you, Marianne. And you know, though I never met Bill, I have seen those pictures of his wavy hair, and I think I can see something in the gene pool there with your beautiful hair. <laughs> so thanks so much for your, for your thoughtful words, and we're just um, so appreciative of the continued support of the McGowan Charitable Fund. So I know you can't wait until we get to our panel, uh, moderated by uh, NPR's Michelle Martin, my former ABC News colleague. It's really nice to see her here tonight. Uh, it also includes, as Marianne said, Ron Nesson, Press Secretary for President Ford, Marlon Fitzwater, Press Secretary for Presidents Reagan and Bush, Mike McCurry, Press Secretary for President Clinton, and Robert Gibbs, who was Press Secretary for President Obama, the first Press Secretary for President Obama. Uh, but before we get to this exciting panel, I'd just like to ask you to turn your attention to the screen for a short film in celebration of the 10th anniversary of the William G. McGowan Theater. Country, the debate in American politics and government has been about the role of government. There's a general feeling that um, things are broken, you know, nothing's getting done in Washington. Is that really the truth? Or maybe that's just how the system is constructed in the first place. 227 years ago, none of the world was democratic. Now half the planet's democratic with written constitutions and free speech and minority rights and the rule of law. And that's what success means when the world is becoming American. These thoughts and opinions represent threads that connect America's evolving national dialogue. A dialogue that is freely expressed in its home at the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Built in 2004 to honor the legacy of the late telecommunications pioneer, William G. McGowan, the theater now celebrates 10 years of Mr. McGowan's commitment to the open exchange of ideas on our country and its democracy. So the original architect of this building is uh, John Russell Pope. And so this space was modeled loosely after the auditorium that he did for the Daughters of the American Revolution's uh, Constitution Hall. The program for this space seemed to be that they wanted it to be able to do everything. We designed into it the greatest usage flexibility that we could. Great attention was also paid to the state-of-the-art audio and visual capabilities of the theater. Everything from lectures, forums, presentations from the archives, and Oscar documentary screenings can be recorded, projected, and live streamed in this elegant public setting free of charge. An annual example of the theater in action is the McGowan Forum on Communications, Technology, and Government. Its founder was William McGowan's wife and president of the William G. McGowan Fund, Sue Jin McGowan. One would ask why the McGowan Fund opted to support this theater and the ongoing forum series. Well, if you knew Bill, you would know why. Bill loved history. He loved movies. He loved debating the great ideas of the day. And it is fitting that a theater created in his memory now provides lively conversation. It's likability. And the American people almost always vote for the most likable person. Well, yeah, and I knew, I sat at dinner with, with John Kerry two years before he oh. ran, and I knew he wasn't going to win. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> I sat on the finance committee during one of the healthcare debates and they were gonna put a 20% tax on mammograms. And it was like the light, I, I, said, I said, guys, you know, you may not need to get them, 
but do you really want to tax women's health like this? Well, you could almost hear the pop, 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 yeah. pop, yeah. of the light bulbs going off, like, oh, yeah, I thought it like that. See, <laughs> you know, we're flying scary flying robots and killing people with them. There's no scary flying robot clause of the Constitution, <laughs> right? You know, the only thing the Constitution has to say about surveillance is that it should be reasonable, mm -hmm. or that it should not be unreasonable, mm -hmm. and that you generally need a warrant except when you don't. Um, this is the daughter of James Byrd, who was dragged to death in Texas because some guys didn't like the color of the skin he was in. Racism is the biggest problem in this country. Racism is the biggest problem in this world. And we have to take steps with each other to keep inviting each other that, you good? I'm good. Can we all not get along? Letters transcribed. It's the National Archive telling us directly, this is ours. This is ours. This, the things in here, the artifacts, the things that we created that we are saving and preserving together as a nation, it's ours. Dialogue, debate, democracy. During its first 10 years, the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives has carved out an essential role in the vast historical and cultural landscape of Washington, D.C. With ongoing support from the William G. McGowan Fund and the Foundation for the National Archives, the theater will continue to foster an open dialogue about America and its democracy for many years to come. So in the words of young Jeezy, let's go to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, I thought we would start this the way we <coughs> usually end these things, by saying thank you. <laughs> this is the week when we recognize the service of people who've served their country in uniform, <coughs> our country in uniform, and all of you served in public service. So I'm just going to start by saying thank you. Is that OK? You're thank welcome. you for your time. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm thinking that, that there are others here who served. If you served in any of the administrations represented here, will you be known to us? Will you just briefly give us a little wave? Can we say thank you? Thank you. Um, and we'll talk about the whole relationship between the media and press secretaries. But if there are any press secretaries here, whether you served on Capitol Hill or in the White House, elsewhere, can we make yourself, and if you especially returned my phone calls, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't, well, thank you anyway. Okay. <laughs> Any press secretaries here? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's a little like the defendant uh, pre, uh, thanking the prosecution, but whatever. So anyway, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about what we really want to talk about, which is all the things that we wanted to know when we were sitting in those chairs and you're sitting in your chair that we didn't get to talk about then. So this is our chance to spill it. So let's do that. So the first thing I wanted to know is, did you actually want these jobs? Or were you, did you get drafted or did you volunteer? And Ryan and I will start with you because you were a, a correspondent for NBC. You covered the Vietnam War. In fact, you were grievously wounded and as I recall, almost died. You come back here, you actually reported on the administration, you reported on uh, Gerald Ford's inauguration, and then you were reporting on the, 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 the then press secretary's appointment, and all of a sudden, you, you're the guy. How did he talk <laughs> you into that? 
Well, as you say, I had uh, been a reporter for a long time, and uh, I had also covered the White House uh, for about uh, two and a half years when Lyndon Johnson was president, and then I covered the first month of the Ford White House. And I think what persuaded me to do, uh, to take the job when he offered it was, I wanted to see what it looked like on the inside. <laughs> In fact, I wrote a book afterward called It Sure Looks Different on the Inside. Because <laughs> I had the sense as a reporter that I probably knew 10% of what was going on in the White House. And I, one of the reasons I took this job was I wanted to see what the other 90% was. That was one reason. I think the other reason clearly was that I really liked Gerald Ford. I covered him, um, as I say, as an NBC correspondent, and, um, and so that was the other reason for taking the job, because I, I, really I really did like him. The third reason, uh, I'm ashamed to say, is that <laughs> I, uh, I had a pretty large uh, ego in those days. <laughs> And I thought, hmm, I'm moving, up, I'm moving up to a White House job. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Very satisfying for a guy with a big ego. <laughs> Marlon Fitzwater, what about you? You actually first went to the White House as a deputy, right? <clears throat> right. Yeah. I uh, was in the civil service. And I was at the Treasury Department when uh, Jim Baker called and said, we, were gonna, we need a deputy for domestic policy, somebody to take the heat for the president on uh, the recession, which we were about ready to hit 10% unemployment. Mm -hmm. Do you want, would you be interested? I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he said, come over. And I went over, spent an hour with him, and he said, you want the job? I said, sure. And he said, let's go see the president. We walked down to the Oval Office, and President Reagan was sitting there. He said, well, Marlon, Jim here says you're willing to help out. I said, yes, sir. That was it. Come, come. First time I ever met him, and uh, first minute I'd ever spent time with him. And I immediately walked out the door. I said, Mr. President, I'll do my best. And I got outside the uh, media, the Oval Office into the secretary's area, and I went, yes! <laughs> and she said, what is that all about? I said, history must always record that even if I get fired tomorrow, I, for one day I was a press secretary. <laughs> 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 well, why'd you say yes? You could have said no. You know, I don't want that job. Why? Well, you know, I mean, wait a minute. Dealing with people like me every day. Okay, really? <laughs> well, I don't. You know, I was a professional public affairs person. I'd been in government 17 years at the time I went to the White House. I worked in a lot of different agencies, and so the White House was the pinnacle of our profession, a professional deal. And the other thing was, I didn't know what the White House was all about. I mean, I remember walking in to see that press corps, and, and Helen Thomas said, what are you doing here, kid? <laughs> uh, and, I, and it was all downhill from there. <laughs> Mike, Mike, what about you? You'd come to the White House from the State Department, and uh, you'd been at the well, DNC. It wasn't a direct. My, uh, my yeah. story is a little different. Yeah. I had been around in Washington as a press secretary for 20 years, and I had worked for, I'm sure everyone remembers the administration of President John Glenn, <laughs> President Bruce Babbitt, <laughs> President Mike Dukakis, <laughs> and I had worked for, not to be President, Bob Kerry. So it was actually probably because I have an unfailing ability to pick the losing candidate. <laughs> I had worked against Bill Clinton in the primary. So my, my thought was I was not likely to get a job. But George Stephanopoulos took some pity on me and said, look, this guy's been around for a long time. He, was, he worked at the Democratic National Committee for a long time. So we, you know, he, he could probably do a job. And luckily, Warren Christopher, who was Secretary of State, hired me to be spokesman. But, but after two years, uh, working at the State Department and doing the job there and maybe something we'll talk about later, being on television because at that point the State Department briefing was televised, the White House briefing was not fully televised. Um, I caught the notice of some folks at the White House and they invited me to come over. I, I don't know that I ever kind of angled for it, but it, kinda, it made sense because I, I had, you know, obviously worked in presidential politics for a pretty long time and it made some sense that that would be the trajectory that I wound up in. Did you have a yes? Did you do that? Uh, no, because it was, <laughs> if you remember, 
Uh, we're in the aftermath of an election now that is not to be called shellacking, I guess. But in <laughs> 1994, at the end of that midterm campaign, things were pretty grim at the White House. And I moved to the White House in 1995 as a result of a, what was then a, a pretty large shakeup in the White House staff. Leon Panetta came in as chief of staff, and so I was part of a transition that happened in the aftermath of what was a pretty bruising political midterm. And not clear that things were going to get sorted out anytime soon. So it was not a happy moment that you would celebrate. Mm -hmm. So why'd you do it? Um, because it was an honor to be asked to work in that place. I think all of us would say it's the coolest place on the face of the earth to work. And even though I had had a great time, I had never been outside the country very much, and I had just worked for the Secretary of State and been all over the world. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> but the opportunity to work in the White House you know, to drive up that little West Executive Drive and say, I, I got my own parking place right here, <laughs> right outside the West Wing, and uh, it, it's, a, it's an honor. Even when the subject matter you have to deal with becomes fairly zesty. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that in a minute. But before we do, Robert Gibbs, what about you? I mean, if you're on a campaign, isn't kind of the working assumption that if, you, if your guy wins, you're going to get the job, or gal? Eventually. I, I think Maybe. in most instances, by the time you get yeah. to the end of the campaign, you have a fairly decent chance or decent sense of if this person wins, who's likely to, to be the press secretary. I, I, I think Mike's absolutely right. I think um, you, you realize pretty quickly how great an honor and a great a responsibility it is. Um, when, you, when you do drive into that White House, a lot of days when it's dark um, and you, you realize sitting in that Oval Office throughout the week, what you're witnessing, what you're trying to describe, and what you're part of, I, you know, I think it's a, a truly amazing honor. I do remember pretty early into my first briefing, and I was listening to a question, and it was about 10 minutes in, and I, I, I remember this voice in my head saying, I can't believe you're here doing this. <laughs> and then there was another voice saying, pay attention to the question. Because <laughs> I, I thought it would be amazingly embarrassing to somehow miss a, an entire question in your first briefing. Uh, so, uh, but I, I, I think that's, you know, you, you understand that however long you're there, you're just, you're going to get to witness and see things in a seat that, um, very, very few people have, and, and it's, it's remarkable and it's amazing. So let's keep it going, because, uh, you know, the, 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 well, for those of you who It's all Washington, good times. Just yes, keep exactly. going. We're, 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 we'll get to some of those. Other, <laughs> we'll, start, we'll start it out soft. So, you, you know, the Post has this feature called Date Lab, which thankfully, as a married person, I don't have to really know about. <laughs> but um, but they're, when they're trying to fix people up, they have this thing called get, brag a little. So brag a little. Like, what was your best day? What was your best day? Robert, you want to start? I, I think our, um, our best day was probably uh, signing health care. Um, uh, I'm starting with you because I don't know that you're going to get too many more questions like this. But. <laughs> yeah, well, not for a few more years, yeah, that's exactly. for sure. So anyway, go ahead. Um, no, I, I, I think, I, I just think that the, the sense of accomplishment and the euphoria of, uh, you know, walking into the East Room uh, and, and and, and having, having the president sign that. And, and, and now, you know, you have people come up to you and say, you know, I, I you know, had a condition for 15 years. I could never get health care. Thank you for being part of something like that. I think was, um, that was probably it. Plus, that also that day is, you know, that's when Joe Biden said into an open microphone mm -hmm. <laughs> just how big an accomplishment that yeah. was. Exactly, he did. And, and I remember I went back to my office after the signing, and I, you know, when you're in the East Room, you can't, the microphone is connected to the malt which goes into the camera. You, you couldn't, it wasn't, it's not an audible microphone. So I couldn't hear it, and I'm there, and, and somebody comes running in and says, oh, you should just know. The microphone sort of picked this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so we're talking about it, and then somebody, one of my other deputies, rushes in and says, I don't think he said that. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll get some of the technology of this, but I remember I, 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 I was on Twitter, and I thought, you know, I'll, let me try to sum this up. So I remember I sat down, and I'm like, and 
I, so I wrote, yes, Mr. Vice President, it really is. And I hit send. And I think my phone is. So then, and you, okay, demerit. Interview so, demerit. I I and so okay. about two minutes later, uh, my assistant comes in and says, the, the vice president's chief of staff's on the phone. <laughs> Damn, I should have checked with them before I tweeted. Um, <laughs> and, and it was one of those things, and again, sometimes in, 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 even in politics, honesty is the best policy. <laughs> and Ron Klain called in, and I picked up the phone, and I'm like, hey, Ron, I'm trying to pretend like nothing was going on. <laughs> and he just said, thank you. <laughs> And he said, we were over here trying to figure out what the statement would say. And then we read your tweet, and it was like, yeah, you know, just sort of own it. And it was so, <laughs> that was a good day. All right. Can you turn your phone off, though? I am going to turn my yeah, phone off. Good it point. Off. Thank you. <laughs> I just have to find Appreciate my that. phone. Who's next? Mike, you want to say, what was your best day? Um, yeah, much more mundane than that, although I love, love that story. And, and thinking of that, you know, you were the only one of the four of us that had to worry about tweeting because I. <laughs> right. It's a whole other conversation. And it's a whole yeah. different job. I mean, I, I think the job that you ended up having to do just because of the changes in technology and media uh, went by so quickly. Um, but mine was okay, very mundane, but it kind of it captured, as I think back on it, what I think the best of what the press secretary can do was. And it was a day that we announced in the Clinton administration that we were promulgating a very complicated federal regulation to regulate tobacco for the very first time. And it was premised on the theory that a cigarette is a delivery, medical delivery device designed to deliver a dose of nicotine to the body, which was stretching things, as the Supreme Court later concluded. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the, the Regulation went on 30 pages in the Federal Register, and I stayed up a good part of the night to read it, even though I said, okay, the briefing the next day, we're going to bring in Donna Shalala, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, David Kessler, who's the head of the Food and Drug Administration, and they'll, they'll do the briefing, but I want to make sure it's a big deal, and I want to make sure I know what's going on. Well, Donna Shalala and David Kessler got up there, and it was so complicated, and they instantly got way down into the weeds, <laughs> and... You guys all know Terry Hunt from the Associated Press, and he's standing there looking up, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> And it was clear to me, watching the reporters, that we were losing the story because they were having a hard time explaining it. And I, sort of, I got up and elbowed Donna Shalala out of the podium, which is <laughs> a very difficult thing to do, you know. Her. <clears throat> and I, and I kind of took over the briefing, and then I got the head of the Food and Drug Administration, the Secretary of Health and Human Services there, and I'm looking at them saying, am I explaining this correctly? But I had to, I had to simultaneously translate that complicated language and vocabulary of government to something that would actually get through and help the reporters write the story. And a couple of them came up and said, boy, you saved your buns there because we were not getting any clue what you were talking about. <laughs> That's the best of what the press secretary can do. I mean, we get accused of being spin doctors. We probably sometimes get a little angry at the press corps. But at the heart of it is trying to take the work that the White House does, the president does, and the federal government does, and help the American people understand it. So I mean, that you know, it was not the most dramatic day. I had plenty of those. But it was the day in which I felt like I really did my job. Mm -hmm. Ron, you want to go next? J just to follow up on that, one of, my, one of my best days in the White House was when uh, I smoked when I first went to the White House. And a bunch from the press office went to these, decided to, to join this class called Smoke Enders. <laughs> and we went, I think it's eight weeks or so, and I stopped smoking. So, But seriously, my best day in the White House clearly was <laughs> when um, I had to uh, stand up and announce the end of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And I had, um, as I say, as an NBC correspondent, had covered the war. Mm -hmm. I did five tours there as a correspondent, got wounded, almost died. And then I'm the one who had to go over into the uh, old executive office building and read the statement from the president uh, saying, for us, the war is over. And I've got an old-fashioned cassette tape of that at home my voice is about five octaves higher than normal, <laughs> very quavery uh, because of what Vietnam had meant in, in my life. And here I'm the one who has to stand up 
and announced the end of the war. Did you want to cry? Yes. Did you cry? Not in, not in public, but in private I did. Hmm. Hmm. What about you, Marlon? You know, I'm thinking the, what was your best day? I'm thinking that, you know, the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall this week, and I remember, uh, I shouldn't admit that I remember that. <laughs> well, what about you? I was just. Well, there's so, you know, much. there's so many uh, days and events that you run through your mind, whether it's uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall or the invasion of Kuwait, uh, liberation of Kuwait, uh, or Panama, or those kinds of things. But I think the most uh, special day, memorable for me, was the, the first day of the Reagan-Gorbachev summit in 1987. And everyone was anticipating the end of the Cold War, and Gorbachev had never been to the West. Everybody in the world wanted to see how he would get along with the guy who said it was an evil empire over there. And uh, we had 7,000 correspondents credentialed to attend the, the summit. So we moved the White House briefing room to the ballroom of the JW Marriott Hotel. <laughs> and we also uh, renovated half the Commerce Department on at least the first floor uh, for an overflow crowd. And uh, we got all 7,000 people packed in there. And I explained for several days why uh, we were accommodating these people and also that I had invited my counterpart, Gennady Gennad Gerasimov, to brief with me. My rationale was if we were both there on the stage, we wouldn't get in an argument across town, <laughs> which is what normally happens in these cases. And I figured neither one of us wanted to upstage our principles or create a war. We would be very careful. And uh, he and I talked about it. We were going to be careful. So we got to the, to the uh, podium, and we walked up uh, kind of on the stage like this, and we were about halfway across. And Sam Donaldson was sitting in the front row, and he said, 50 bucks, Marlon takes them. <laughs> <laughs> my first response, well, that's sweet. <laughs> but my second one was, he just destroyed every purpose I had for this entire show. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a memorable five days. But what was that? why was that your best day? Was it because of what it meant or because of your role in it? No, I think partially because of what it meant to the world, to us, uh, it, it was the beginning of the end. It was the unveiling of the Reagan-Gorbachev relationship and all the arms control agreements that went with it. Uh, at the same time, it had this kind of uh, very exotic, incredible uh, surrounding where Access Hollywood was sitting in the front row and <laughs> Entertainment Tonight was tops of my phone list and <laughs> things like that. So it was a great show, great pavilion. Uh, and last of, all, last of all, it was it was fragile, and the mistakes could have been disastrous. And I really had kind of underestimated all that. Um, so, but anyway, you put it all together, and it was really a series of experiences you don't very often get. Mm -hmm. So, when you have an awesome day like that, does the president ever come say, "Oh, good job"? You know, President up, Bush or, listened or, or to or you, almost every briefing I gave. He had a squawk box on the desk. And he would call me immediately as I got back to the office. Sometimes he would send a note down while I'm briefing. Uh, wow. Which one, and President he almost Reagan always said, good job. But sometimes he would say, a criticism was, Marlon, I might say that a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> what that about anybody off. else? Did he... Aren't you going to ask us what our worst day was? Oh, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm just letting you ease into it. All right, go ahead. What was your worst day? Well, I think uh, clearly my, well, the worst day was when uh, Ford lost the election to Carter, I think. But uh, I think one of the most difficult days was when Betty Ford uh, went out to uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital and had a uh, mammogram and discovered she had breast cancer. And she underwent a, a mastectomy. And uh, I'll never forget the look on Ford's face. I mean, they had been married for 30 years. They were so close and so in love. And, you know, he was in danger of losing her. And uh, she wanted to put out the news while she was still in the operating room, sent a message out. And I think by being so open about this, 
it, it resulted in a lot of women going and having mammograms. And Happy Rockefeller, the vice president's wife, discovered she had breast cancer. My mother went and had a mammogram, discovered she had breast cancer. And this happened all over the country. Um, but as I say, Ford and Betty had been so close. And um, he wanted to talk to the press after he found out you know, what was going on. And I said, well, you know, he was obviously shaken. And I said, you know, why don't you take a couple of minutes? And no, 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 I'm, I'm in. And, you know, you can, if you ever look at this old film, you'll see, you know, how rattled he was. Mm -hmm. She was an amazing person. And uh, as you know, she also had a drinking and drug problem, which she was very open about. And that also led a lot of people to, to deal with that problem. But why was that your worst day? Because you felt what? Because you were afraid that he was going to lose it or that you were going to lose it or, and it would reflect poorly on him? Why was it your worst day? Just because it was so sad? You Be were so scared? Well, yeah, because mm -hmm. she was such a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. And he was so stricken by it. And, you know, she was in such great risk. Mm -hmm. It had a happy ending, of course. Yes, it sure did. Anybody but else? Hmm, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, you know, it's funny because I... <laughs> Just Everyone assumes that the days of La Faire Monique would have been, you know, the hard days. But they were, they were relatively easy days. The press corps was consumed with only one subject, and I was saying nothing. <laughs> so it was just basically, uh, as I said at the time, a hundred different ways to be double parked in the no comment zone. And, you know, so, and, and it was just bizarre, but it wasn't particularly challenging or hard or wasn't the worst day. It was just unbelievable. <laughs> but my worst day was, and, and Ron, I, I appreciate it. It's the emotion that goes into it sometimes because we're supposed to go out there and be very cool and collected and calm. And so, as someone said in the introduction, you know, we have to keep it together all the time. And I, <clears throat> my hardest day was I had worked as Ron Brown's director of communications when, when he was the chairman of the DNC. And the day his plane crashed on a trade mission in the Balkans and went down, and it was an awful thing because there were a lot of young people, and many of the folks on the White House staff knew who had been part of the advance party who were also killed in that crash. And I remember we had, I mean, we had in the Oval Office, I don't know how the White House communications folks did this, but we had, piped into the Oval Office, the guys who were on the search and rescue team who were up there to confirm the identity of the body. And, and I remember it was awful. And, and the president called Alma Brown. And it was very emotional. And then it happened right around the time of the briefing. And so I said, OK, got to go out and brief, because everyone's going to want to know what's going on. And I didn't stop to collect myself, because here's a guy who I, I had crossed swords with. I think the only time I ever got fired in my life, Ron Brown fired me, and that we, <laughs> we had you know, a wonderful relationship despite that. And I remember going out there, and I got about two-thirds of the way into this, and I felt myself losing it. Mm. And I didn't, I, you know, I still feel myself losing it a little bit. And I, I, I had to stop. and. Say, so I, I need to, I, you know, I had, I looked out at my staff and they could tell I was in turmoil, so someone came up and handed me a note which said, get off now. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out and pretended that I was getting some important information from the president and then came back and, and was able to do the briefing. But it, it's those moments that we could, you know, you, we handle a lot and prepare for a lot, but every once in a while you get something that just jerks you out of your place. Mm -hmm. And I think those, those, those were the hardest moments. Now, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't the worst moment. Maybe it was the hardest mm -hmm. moment. Martin, what about you? What was your hardest day? Well, you know, I don't really know that I, that I can point to a hardest day. It's, as, as I hear these stories, you know, it strikes me we've all had stories like this. Uh, Mrs. Reagan had a double mastectomy. And, uh, sh and I had to announce it on television. And uh, well, there wasn't much experience at talking about 
breasts on television. <laughs> and I was scared to death, I want to tell you. But I... But you do know what they are. I, got, I, I had a passing acquaintance. Yet. I was a little concerned, but... So anyway, it was over and she called me and said, would you come up to the... This is after she got back from the hospital. and said, would you come up to the residence? And I went up and she uh, said, well, I just want to tell you I thought you did a great job. And are there any questions the press are asking about it? And I said, well... Yes, they want to know why you had a double mastectomy when they're now developing other less invasive kinds of operations. And she said, just tell them this, I want to live. Mm. She's still alive today. Mm. Mm. So there's a lot of days like that that yeah. are really moving. Yeah, that, indeed. you know, I wouldn't say it was my worst day, but you live with it. I remember one morning I came in and Helen Thomas says, you're killing Palestinian babies. You are. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> she says, over the night, they killed 30 Palestinian babies, and you're responsible. And I said, Helen, what are you talking about? She said, that, that's happened. You're part of this administration. You're part of these policies. You're guilty. And she stomped off. And uh, two of my deputies heard all the screaming and came in. And I was crying. And they said, why? Why? And I said, you know, I, I just don't think I deserve this. How can this, how can this be? Uh, but it got over it. You go on, you know. Is that the worst day? Probably not. But I will, I will remember it all my life. Why, why did that Could make you Could we take cry? about yeah. a half hour to tell... Uh, yeah. Helen Thomas story. <laughs> we, we, we can. Yeah, we could. We could. But what, why, did, why did that make you cry? Because it would just seem so unfair and so unprofessional, hmm. and not and not uh, my responsibility, and not um, and it was just painful. Mm -hmm. The idea that I was responsible for killing children. Do you feel that I'm wondering if why you? I would never have known this if you hadn't said this. I mean, do you feel that it's your job not to let people know you have feelings? Yeah, I don't tell those stories very often. Tw it took 20 years to get this one out. <laughs> what about you, Robert? I think the hardest days are uh, when you have really big things collide. And, and I think Mike's, Mike makes a, a good point. The, the actually, the, the easiest days to get ready to brief are the hardest days to brief. Mm. And what I mean by that is, they give you, you know, you've got this notebook, and it's got 20 or 25 things yeah. in it. But if you know you're only going to get one question asked six different ways, you don't really have to pay attention to the other 19 tabs in the binder. <laughs> yeah, we called, right? we, called, we called it the kitchen sink day because right. everything in the kitchen sink was yeah. going to get asked right. that day. So you had to have 10 times as many answers. Before. Right. So, look, I remember um, every day of the oil spill um, was, was brutal. Um, but, you know, I remember during the oil spill was when Rolling Stone popped their story about Stanley McChrystal, and we've got to call a four-star general back from Afghanistan, and, you know, I, I remember walking over to the residence, you know, I'd called the president and said, I, I think you need to read this story. And I walked over and he met me downstairs and he read the first two paragraphs and he just we had a quick conversation. He said, just uh, whoever's left, it was kind of late at night, just let's meet in the Oval Office in 10 minutes. So you have these things that, these events that collide. I remember the shooting at Fort Hood, what an awful day that was, and pretty, you know, decent part in the evening, we'd spent probably two or so hours, maybe five or six of us, seven or eight, I forget how many, in the Oval Office with Bob Gates and Admiral Mullen and... Um, Bob Mueller from the head of the FBI, the president, um, talking through, and I don't, won't tell, tell everything, but talking through some of the stuff that they'd already learned in the investigation. And I remember that was a Thursday because I remember I'm walking out of the Oval Office and I see Larry Summers waiting and he's walking in and all of a sudden I remember, oh yeah, tomorrow's, tomorrow's employment report. Mm -hmm. And of course the the White House economic team will get the employment report 
and they don't, you know, it comes out 8.30 in the morning, it's the day for, you know, two years, you're just waiting for the employment report. And Larry was going in to tell the president what the report was, and I remember, you know, again, I'm so focused on Fort Hood and the investigation, the FBI, and all this stuff, and I see Larry, and I'm like, I kind of crane, and I like, like, go like this, and he just goes, <laughs> and I remember going, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that unemployment surpassed 10% since wow. Reagan. And, you know, so again, there's those moments where you've got all this stuff and then something collides. I think the most powerful moment um, was late October in 2009, and we were in the midst of the Afghanistan review. And a, a, an IED had just exploded uh, on a, uh, uh, basically, a truck carrying a bunch of our soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so there were 18 dead. And um, the president had uh, lifted, when he came into office, the ban on press coverage of the transfer process at Dover. Mm. And we, we knew at some point we would go to Dover. And we figured this was a good time to go to Dover. Yeah. And we left the White House about 12.45 at night um, unaccompanied in a helicopter. It's about a 45-minute ride to Dover. And I'll never forget, we, we, the helicopter comes down, and, and they'd given us the tail number of the giant plane that had all the transfer cases in them. And I remember we put the helicopter down, and I, I, look, at, I look out the window, and I, the first tail number is this giant plane, and it's that, that one. And I can remember coming off the helicopter and seeing in, in, in these neat little rows, 18 transfer cases with the flag. And, and the process, you know, is, is done, it's, it's a remarkable ceremony. And we were sort of there, we, we were there for about four hours. And, um, you know, they, they, the president went out with the, the honor guard, they go, they get one of the transfer cases, they, Bring it off. It's a whole ceremony, and um, I'll never forget. We we got on the helicopter and we flew back to the White House. We landed a little after four in the morning, and um, I remember the next morning, uh, a great friend of mine still is David Axelrod said, uh, "What did you guys talk about on the way home? What did he say?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Nobody said a word on the." We just got on the helicopter, and you just, you know, we were, again, we were in the midst of Afga the Afghanistan review, and I, I think the, the president, you're, you're there watching the president go through this very dignified transfer, and, and you're knowing that he's sitting there thinking, I'm going to make a decision where somebody is going to come back like that. And you meet the families, and it, it's just one of those things where you, I, you know, we, we had to describe it the next day, and we did the pool reports, and I never really had to go out and brief on it, but I just remember thinking, there are those moments in which you begin to feel a little bit of what they're going through. Yeah. And, and in a real sort of, in a way that you just feel like, you, you can understand for a brief moment what, what weighs on their shoulders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So switching gears now, did you ever lie? Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you lie? Did any of you lie? I think um, I never really lied. <laughs> I think I often. Are you lying? Now we're not talking to your girlfriend. <laughs> okay. And I'm not lying now. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I, I mean, one of the promises I made when I took the job was I will never lie and I'll never cover up. But I, and I didn't. I really kept that promise. I think sometimes I worded things <laughs> in the, to make them, you know, less. True? No, no. <laughs> no, just uh, l less damaging, let's say. But, uh, Did you ever feel you came close? Huh? Did you feel you walked up to the line? Of line. Did you I probably like walked that? up to the line, sure. Uh -huh. I think we all uh, walked up to the line. But, you know, don't forget this. Let me just back up half a step. Uh -huh. Ford 
succeeded Richard Nixon. And he had done, you know, great damage to the presidency and so forth by the Watergate and how he handled Watergate. And I think this made all the people in the Ford administration determined to go in a completely different direction. Plus the fact that I came out of the press. And I knew that there was always a suspicion that the, you know, that the press uh, was, I mean, the press secretary was not being completely honest with us and so forth. And uh, I, just to, just to tell you, and this is, I'm not making this up, just to show you <laughs> how I was determined to be completely different than the Nixon White House. Nixon's press secretary was named Ron Ziegler. And one of the things I said when I was first appointed Ford's press secretary was, I'm a Ron, but not a Ziegler. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, you know, given the fact that Ford had succeeded Nixon and, and what how the Nixon administration ended, uh, you know, I, and the fact that I came out of the press, and the fact that Ford, you know, in his whole political career had built a reputation mm -hmm. for honesty and so forth. So, uh, you know, we may have delayed putting out some stories. Uh, as I say, I may, I may have described them in the best possible terms without lying, but uh, I never did lie, and uh, that was a real promise to myself and to the press corps. Yeah, Michelle. I, I mean, it, go ahead, Mike. You you can you cannot lie in that job. I mean, there's just it, it's it's career ending. I mean, if you ever yeah. got caught knowingly misleading the press, there the consequences of that would be the rupture in that relationship of fragile trust that exists anyhow, and you wouldn't be useful to the president. Now well, I well, now I did. I mean, I I got in trouble one time. Helen mm -hmm. Thompson Thomas asked me that question. And I said, no, I, yeah, I've never lied, but I certainly learned how to tell the truth slowly. <laughs> <laughs> and well, then, and there, there are times, I mean, there are times, there are times, I mean, I, I, what I was thinking when I answered that question was, yeah, we were up in Martha's Vineyard after this really bizarre thing in which the president had to go on national television talking about things that we were all familiar with. The very next day, we were going off on a happy family vacation to Martha's Vineyard and I knew that we were going to be going back to the White House because we were getting ready to launch a cruise missile strike against Osama bin Laden to try to catch him at a little powwow that he was having. And I remember being at the little schoolhouse at Martha's Vineyard, which I'm sure Robert, I think Robert's probably been there. <coughs> and the you know the reporters they want to go to the beach, so they're kind of like hanging around saying, "Hey, you know, when are we going to get the lid? And we want to like when are you guys going to wrap things up?" You know what the lid is, right? The lid is when the, there's no news. White House says the lid is, no yeah. more news for the rest of the day. So mm -hmm. you're free and clear unless some emergency happens. So it's basically our signal to them that we're not going to be putting out any more news during the day. And what do you say? I mean, you know, I did it. Was it a lie for me to say, uh, you know, no, no lid right now. I'm just going to check and see what's going on, see if there's anything happening. You know, yeah, we, we're going to war in about an hour and a half. Would you like mm -hmm. to stick around? <laughs> Um, so, so you, I mean, there, there are techniques that you have to use, mm -hmm. and sometimes they border on a thing called spin, which is that you're trying to take your best interpretation and offer it up. But I think if you knowingly mislead the American people and the, their representatives, the press corps, you're toast. Mm -hmm. And I think Mar that's a good thing, probably. Marlon, you had access to classified information, right, in that you were part of the group of nine, correct, in your administration? So what, how did you handle that? I mean, did you say, don't tell me anything that I can't tell? Or what did you, how did you handle that? Did you? Well, first of all, I um, was fortunate to become press secretary to both Reagan and Bush under circumstances where I knew them. I'd worked with them before in lesser jobs. And in both cases, I went to them and said, I want to be in all meetings, including all National Security Council meetings. And President Bush, who had been director of the CIA, said, well, no, well, that's nearly not the way we work. We have compartmentalization, and we have cl classified information, and we determine who, gets, who, has, who has a need to know and all that. I said, well, my view is I need to know everything you know. And he said, well, well let's see how it works. Um, and the last thing I said to him was, if I divulge classified information, 
fire me. I'm out. I'm out that day. Five o'clock that night, I'm gone. He said, okay. So with that uh, our deal, really, at the beginning, uh, I would go into all these meetings, and often the Pentagon would call back and say, why is Fitzwater here? And fortunately, President Bush, about the second time this happened, he started a meeting and everybody was lined up and I was just a half a second late coming through the door and he said, let's just all wait for Marlon until he gets here. <laughs> there was never a question again about why I was supposed to be there and, and why not. Um, but in my own mind, I had to worry about that every time. And what I would do, first of all, is make a judgment on my own and try to decide, am I really confident this is not classified? Then I'd go to General Scowcroft, who's our national security advisor, and say, is this classified? Am I getting in trouble here? And he would often say, well, here's a better way to say it, or here's something a little more nuanced. Uh, and it, it saved me so many times from saying something that I shouldn't have said yeah. to have a process and have it in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike makes a really interesting point here about if a press secretary lies he loses credibility and why we have to be so careful about that. And I have two quick examples. One was Larry Speaks, who was asked if we were going to invade Granada, to the word the press had gotten the tip. He went to the National Security Advisor and the National Security Advisor said, that's preposterous, absolutely <laughs> not. Larry didn't know, he wasn't involved. He went back to the press and said, preposterous, absolutely not. <laughs> the next morning, of course, we did, we did, we had over that night. And the press never treated him well again. It was similarly Jody Powell with, with President Carter was part of the, he knew what was going on. He was very close to President Carter and he was a part of the considerations on the uh, attempt to rescue the hostages in Iran. And one night they were making the hostage rescue attempt, the press got a word of it and went to him and said, is this happening? Jody just hadn't thought about it. He hadn't spent time, what do I do when this question happens? And uh, he, in his own mind, said the same thing I probably would have said. I think I would have. That the most important thing here is the mission and protecting the lives of our troops. And I am not going to admit this no matter what. But what Jody did is he just kind of hadn't thought it through. And he said, no, it's not going on. It's not happening. Well, of course, it did. And Jody had trouble from there on. His deputy took over the briefings, and it was a terrible thing. And Jody was a good press secretary, a really good one. Yeah. Uh, but it was just, uh, it just happened. So you, you kind of live in fear of that all the time. And I, I know we've all come close. Robert, you well, wanted to say something? Then Ron can Well, jump I would just say, I mean, I, I, and I've talked a little bit about this, but I remember at the very beginning of the administration, it, I know it's going to sound preposterous, but you know, um, you know, they, one of the things they said: don't don't even acknowledge, forget drone strikes. Don't even acknowledge that there's a program that does this. And you know, you're you're new, and like you know, you're you're freaked out about saying something that's classified. Okay, probably like the third day I was briefing, somebody asked me about a drone strike. I I, I don't. Do I have any information on that? And, and I'm, you know, not going to get into. It's on the damn front page of the New York Times, <laughs> right? Because somebody has has reported we've killed six people in a drone strike. Yet the press secretary to the president of the United States is not capable of acknowledging a program in which that even exists. And and I've said this now since I left. I I, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything about it then. And I, I wish I would. I wish I would have because. You cannot have somebody standing up there saying something like that while they're reading the New York Times. It's, it's sort of preposterous. I have an example sort of like Marlin's. I, I, during the Afghanistan review, which we had about, I think probably 12 or 13, mostly three hour situation room meetings to go exhaustively through the process. And after the first meeting, um, Rom, the chief of staff came into my office and said, um, he said, the Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon doesn't want you in those meetings. They said, they don't want a political guy in the meetings. Yeah. 
Mm. Ever been to the Pentagon? Um, <laughs> I didn't say a word. I just reached over to my desk and I picked up my ID because the one great thing about being press secretary is all the Secret Service guys know you don't have to wear your ID. And I just picked it up and I said, if that's the case, then take this and do tell me how it all works out. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? And I said, I said, if those guys think I'm in there to give him political advice about Afghanistan, then the idea that they don't know the president is, it, it, that's the biggest understatement in the world. But I said, if you think I'm going to go, the president's going to go into a three-hour meeting in which we're going to repeat a dozen times, and you think I'm going to come walking up to somebody who sat in that meeting and say, hey, I'm... I'm about to go brief. The president's just been in these three-hour meetings. Can you give me the five-minute rundown of what they talked about so that I can go answer 30 minutes of questions about Afghanistan? It's, it's crazy. And I said to him, I said, if you think you, if somebody's gonna, willing to sign up for that, be my guest. Are you serious? You're about to quit? You're prepared I, I, to quit? I, I absolutely would have if I could not have been in that meeting because like Marlon, you have this, you have way more information than you can ever say. Um, and particularly at a time, I mean, look, there's a, I'm sure there was then and there is now a safe in the, in the office where you, you have to lock up classified documents, you have to record when the safe gets open, record when the safe gets closed. There's a lot that, you're, that you get information on. And, and I think if you have somebody who isn't in a lot of that and can't watch it and understand what you're supposed to steer around, then then the whole job becomes sort of moot. Yeah, because if, if I'm not in that, and again, I, it's not as if I'm, and I'm sure that plenty of reporters will go back and look at those briefings and say, well, he didn't really say a lot about those 12 hour, those 12 three hour meetings, but you, you at least get a good sense of what is discussed, the interplay, the issues that they're talking about. You could bring somebody out to do it, a general or something would be just as complicated to do, but if you're not in there listening to that discussion, in those probably 30 some hours worth of meetings, I, I said one thing, and it was the second to last question in the last meeting, after the decision had been made, and the president said, how are we announcing this? And I said, we're doing it at a, with a, a, you're doing a prime time speech at West Point, sir. That's all I said in 12, 12 meetings. And my job wasn't to say anything, my job was to take a lot of notes and, and try to, as best as I could, inform reporters about what was happening. If you can't do that, then, then a briefing wouldn't matter, a press secretary wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, you just, you wouldn't have any capability. Michelle, I, Michelle there, I just, there are two, two important things here. Okay, let's one, hear these two it, important it, things. One then I want is, these folks to get their chance to okay. visit. One is it's not what you know as the press secretary mm -hmm. that gets you in trouble. It's what people around the White House forget to tell you or don't tell you that gets you in trouble. And Marlon in his book talks about the, the, it's about having a process of verifying the information that you get and verifying that you know what you need to know in order to do the briefing. That is critical to the job. But the second thing, which is important, it's come out here, is the president has to protect that role of the press secretary to be there and to know what's going on, and to, to take it all in. And and I have I have had I had the same experience. It, you know, President Clinton would stop meetings and say, "Get old Mike McCurry in here because the press is going to be on him on this," <laughs> and I want him to hear what we're talking about. I mean, he would literally stop meetings and make me come to the meeting so that I would actually see what the conversation was about. And a president who doesn't respect that role is going to screw up the relationship that's important. Well, there's an awful lot well, to talk to about. Just to follow up on that okay, for, Ron, for just a follow second. Up. See, now they're doing to me what I would, what? No, I mean, I, I mean, I do okay. want to follow up on okay, that. Okay, we're going to ask questions here. These two mics um, on either side are for that purpose. So have at it. Go ahead. Well, you know, so, when, uh, when Ford asked me to take this job, um, I made it clear that, and, and he actually he made it clear that I could sit in on any meeting. Uh, sometime Kissinger was not too happy about that. But other than that, I, I could sit in on any meeting. Because if you have to go to another member of the White House staff and say, 
I've been asked a question about this, or I expect to be asked a question about that. How, how should I answer that? They're going to spin you up for their own purposes, you know? They're going to they're give you an answer that helps to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve, not to be truthful with the press. So Ford said, you can sit in on any meeting you want to, uh, which he kept that promise. And uh, as I say, Kissinger was a little bit more of a, of, a, of a problem. But I think that's one of the most important things uh, uh, you can do to make sure you're getting all the facts to pass on to the press. Uh, because if you have to call up somebody else on the staff and say, you know, I think I'm going to be asked a question, or I've been asked a question about so-and-so, how should I answer it? They'll give you an answer that helps them, you know, with whatever the issue is. So uh, that's why I think the press secretary really needs to, uh, okay. to have a meeting daily with the president. You know, you bring in a list. Of, here, I expect to get asked these questions. How, you know, what do you think I ought to say about that? And that and that. Okay, let's talk to the, let's let the folks participate who've ten, been very good about. Ten seconds. The only thing I would say is the different, the, yeah. you're absolutely right about the meetings. That's what's so important. Sometimes they'll say, my door, the press secretary can always come in my office. Well, that's great if you know exactly what you want to ask the president to, in order to respond. A bunch of times it is just watching the process play out in that exactly. meeting, right. mm -hmm. whether it's in the Situation Room, whether it's in the Roosevelt Room. Mm -hmm. They make the a lot Oval of, office. right, or in the Oval Office, they make big decisions. And sometimes you're just sitting there, you're taking notes, and you're watching it. It also helps you get a lot more educated about any issue that exactly. you're ultimately going to Well, speaking right. of getting other issues, there's a bunch of things we all want to talk about. Because one of the other questions I had is, do you all play favorites? Did you all play favorites with who you called Yeah, on? you were my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should have been. Well, you know, there was a, there was a rumor that one of your predecessors uh, uh, called on women based on what color their jacket was. Is that, is that true? I don't, I don't think so. That's I don't okay. know. I well, don't know. when I was, okay. can't recall that. When I was yeah. press secretary. We, you know, we, my, we played favorites only to give to certain news organizations that we thought would put a bigger display on a story to try to get it more exposure over time. It exposure wasn't or liking you, liking no, no, your side? No, no, no. Just to get the story out there. I mean, okay. we'd give it to, if we could, you know, hey, USA Today, we'll give you an exclusive if you'll put it on the front page because then maybe some other people will pay attention and ask about it and we'll get a little more coverage. Yeah. Well, when I was press secretary, there was only one woman in the White House press corps, Helen Thomas. And I have a picture at home. You all desperately want to tell some Helen Thomas stories. <laughs> I'm going to tell you one Helen Thomas. Go ahead, one Helen Thomas. I have a picture at home, a really big picture of me at one of my briefings. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing up at the podium, and you see this wide angle shot of all these reporters. There were no chairs in the briefing room like this. People sat on the floor and in the <laughs> window boxes and so forth. Anyhow, and Helen was always sitting right down in the front, you know. And I'd make whatever announcements I had and said, anybody got any questions? Uh, or I would announce something that the president had done, and Helen would raise her hand, and she said, well, Ron, do you agree with him on that? <laughs> and my answer was always the same. Who gives a damn? I mean, <laughs> I'm here to announce what the president has done and what the president is thinking and saying, and that's my job. She never and thought you jumped the shark, huh? She never <laughs> thought you were on that time. Sir, and you know who we are, so we'd love to know who you are, if that's okay. okay. Uh, I'm Jim Lowen. I wrote a book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Um, and you guys have said that you don't lie, and one of you even said you don't mislead. And yet I think that the American people feel often that they've been lied to. And uh, I recently read an article that uh, tried to analyze why conspiracy theories are so widely believed in America, such as the conspiracy theory about 9-11, that it was an inside job, or the Bush administration did it, or all kinds of them, and so on. And this article went on to point out, though, that oftentimes the people have been lied to, whether it was about what we did in Guatemala or what we did with the CIA giving people LSD or uh, more recently the, the NSA stuff. Um, so I'm just wondering, does the emperor have any clothes? Surely you folks are, are in charge of some of this lying that the American people feel that we've endured for the last I, really 100 wrong, years. You're wrong. That's not true. I mean, we don't, we don't go out and lie. Now, sometimes, you're right, there are things that have happened that our government have done that nobody who is speaking on behalf of the president knows about. There are things but that we have were happened, told, for instance, there are things that, that have happened that our government has done that the president didn't know about. 
But I'm telling you that if people, there's, a, there's an ethic here. And if there's things going on like that that are criminal or wrong or against our Constitution, I am pretty confident that the people on this stage would have alerted the American people or would have done something about it. So I just don't accept the premise. Well, it question. was certainly decades before we learned some of these things. Okay. Well, that's true. Sometimes it takes a long time to go back classify information. Sir? Uh, my name is Mike Lucibella. Uh, my question is actually uh, for Ron. Um, I was wondering if um, what was the hardest thing about transitioning from being a journalist to being a press secretary, and could you talk a little bit more about kind of the differences between being a member of the press and being you know, on the inside? Well, um, you know, just as a, a, a simple sort of practical matter, um, I would uh, a White House car would pick me up at home at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Get to the office at eight o'clock. You got a White House you car? Got a, yeah. You got a car? Yeah. I was thinking, it's like, what the hell? Is that? <laughs> when did that happen? <laughs> I'm going to go there and ask the next question. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he cut a better I deal than we did. <laughs> Never. So I, I leave home at seven o'clock, get to the White House at eight, eat breakfast there, start. Uh, <laughs> talking to my staff about, you know, what, wow. what, uh, what, do you, what do you think we're going to get asked today? And then everybody would farm out to get the answers. And then I'd have a meeting with the president at 10, and my briefing would be at 11. Then in the afternoon, reporters would wander in and out of my office with their own questions, you know. And there were meetings that I attended and so forth. And I would usually get home at night about 8 o'clock. And I had a very young son then, and he would be asleep by the time I got home. He'd been asleep in the morning when I left, and he'd be asleep. And I would wake him up and play with him, because that's the only uh, <laughs> time I would get to see him. So you know, that, 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 that's, a, that's a long day. Uh, but that was the way it worked. Mm -hmm. Robert, you had kids. About this kids? car. Yeah, we wanna, everybody wants to hear about this car. <laughs> Everybody wants to hear about this car. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the big differences between then and now is, is, is televised briefings. I mean, even when I was yeah. there, Marlon, you never had, you very rarely had televised briefings. My partner to the right and then, there is the... Uh, yeah, Mike, what, what's yeah. up with that? What's up with the televised briefings? Um, what made you make that decision, and do you regret it now? I, I had done um, televised briefings at the State Department. The State Department had been televised going all the way back to Hodding Carter when he was the State Department spokesman back in the Iran-Contra um, the Iran hostage crisis. And it seemed weird to me. They had this thing that maybe dated back to Marlon's time where they, they turned on the cameras for like the first two or three minutes mm -hmm. and then turned the lights off. Mm -hmm. And it was, for me, was just disconcerting because I, I felt like I let down a little bit after they turned it off. And, and two people came to me. It wasn't about television. It was about radio. Peter Mayer and Mark Noller, two of the finest <laughs> uh, reporters at the White House, both radio reporters. And they said, we are at a disadvantage here because our print colleagues can, you know, use all the material they get from the briefing, but we don't get any raw material that we need for our broadcasts. We have to go out hour on the hour and report from the White House, and we need sound. We need, we need your briefing. It needs to be available for electronic broadcasts. And I said, okay, well, you know, let's, we'll experiment. And so we kind of kept lengthening the amount of time that the briefing was available. I never asked permission for this, by the way. I just kind of did it. We kind of let it go a little bit longer every day. And finally, Mark Noller came in. You guys know his funny voice. Mike, did you know that the entire briefing was televised last you know, Friday? And I said, yeah. And if you ever make a big deal about it, it'll never happen again. <laughs> and, and it worked fine for three years, 95, 96, 97. And then we got into the escapades with Monica Lewinsky, and I became a daytime soap opera. <laughs> and How did you get away with never answering any questions about that? I never understood that. Because it was, be, well, because it, very important. The, CNN was the only all cable channel, and they weren't that interested in putting the briefing on. I mean, occasionally they would, if something like when the Murrow building blew up in Oklahoma City or something, they would carry stuff live. But there just wasn't that much. The daily briefing was the raw ingredients of news reporting. We were out there giving our point of view. We were getting questions. We were answering questions. We were giving our take on the issues. But the reporters didn't think of it as a, as a news event. It was just part of what went into reporting on the news. And then what happened was, because of the Monica stuff, it became its own separate theatrical event. And everyone has suffered since then. So it was, it was a stupid thing 
for me to allow live coverage. I should have said, you can, yeah, you can record it, you can use it in your later broadcast, but nothing live, unless I grant permission, which was the way it worked at the State Department. At the State Department, if they want to carry the briefing live, they call what's called a filing break, and the spokesman has to grant permission. Mar, how come you never, this gentleman's been waiting very patiently, so I don't want to keep him waiting, but, but you were like totally against it, as I recall. Uh, I want to rise to Mike's uh, mm -hmm. defense, or the other side of the issue, in one way that, uh, well, I, I'm not sure whether it was good or bad in that sense, but I do know this. Mike was a perfect guy to do it first. He was handsome. He was young. <laughs> he was articulate. He knew oh. the government. <laughs> and most importantly, at a time during that uh, scandal or whatever it was. It was a scandal. Uh, when the government, I'm pretty sure of that. When the government was really having difficulties and when the White House was difficulties, Mike was a stable face on the White House and the government during all that period. And I used to watch him and I would say, you know, I don't know whether anybody back behind the scenes, what they're doing or whether they're, you know, going to meetings when they shouldn't or not going or whatever, but Good old Mike is there every day and, and doing the best he can. And it was a face of said, government is still operating. It's not easy. You know, impeachment is no fun for anybody, but we're moving ahead. Uh, and so I think that the television presence paid off in that instance. Now, since then, we haven't had, you know, quite the same kinds of situations, although, uh, I'm not willing to dismiss it entirely uh, because I think there are some circumstances where the television presence is important. Uh, but it makes it a lot different ball game and different for the reporters. I think it was the end of a lot of the print journalism power and influence uh, in, in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and we could examine all that at great length. But uh, it, okay. I it, see. it was a complicated thing. Mm. Sir? And then this gentleman, and I think, where are we? Go ahead. Well, keep going. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. This has been really enlightening. I'm Patrick Wilson, and I'm involved in the Young Founders Society here at the Archives. And uh, we'd love to have all of you uh, join us uh, in the Young Founders Society. But my, my question is actually about something that you haven't talked about yet. Um, mostly you've been talking about the, the transmit mode, right? What messages you're putting out. Almost all of you also served, as you've already alluded to, as internal advisors to the president about what the impact of the press will be on decision making. And I'm wondering if you can just add a little insight into when you have to tell the policy shop, we aren't doing that. That's a dumb idea. The press isn't going to like it. The dog isn't going to hunt. What are some of those times where, as a press advisor, you actually steered policy? Who would you like to answer that? Who would you like to hear from? I think the, for the panel, but. It's who, uh, it's who feels most let, compelled let, let me, to talk about where they've had impact. Let me start with this, because I, I build off a little of what Marlon just said. I do think um, both for the briefing, whether it's televised or not, but the, the briefing does shake government into giving an answer, even when they might not want to. And you know every day, I, I didn't have breakfast at, at 8.15 at the White House. We were in a... <laughs> 7.30 meeting, but we, when we went into that, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm just, but when we went into that 7.30 meeting, there were 10 of us probably in the chief of staff's office, and, and I was always the last one to go because they knew I always had a bunch of stuff. You know, you knew, you had a pretty good sense at 7.30 in the morning what your briefing was going to be like, what your day was going to be like. And, um, you know, you start the process there of making sure people understand we read this in the newspaper today, and we're going to have to say something on it. And we don't get to not say something on it because we're going out there. And I've literally I've been in meetings where people said, you know, well, we don't have a policy problem. We have a communications problem. Oh, okay. Tell me what to say, and I'll fix your policy problem. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, you, you know you're going to say something, and I, I, I can't remember how many times somebody would say, well, it would be good if you didn't get asked that question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but just to be clear, you're not getting asked that question. I'm getting asked that question. And on more than a few occasions, 
you would, you, you know, you'd, you'd sit through a meeting and, you know, nobody would come to a resolution and you'd say, guys, they've advised my briefing for 1.30. So we can do this one of two ways. Either somebody can stick around here and you guys can figure out what we're going to say or tune in around 1.30 and I'll, I'll tell you what the policy is. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable how quick the operation started working when they realized, you know, the one thing the briefing really does is it forces you to have to go out there and talk about things, even if you don't want to talk about them, even if they're classified and they're hard to talk about. But we have a government that every day has to answer those questions. And it, it, it makes the machinery of government work better because those answers are forced. And even if it takes sometimes the press secretary saying, as I remember doing a lot, you know, and I remember sometimes they'd walk guidance in and I would say, we're not saying that. That's crazy. You can't do that. And, you know, you would say, eh, it's not going to work. This is what the story, you can't do that. And you'd go and you'd be 15 or 30 minutes late to the briefing because you'd walk back in and say, you know, I know you don't want to answer this question, but that's not what we're going to say. And it it helps the machinery sometimes when, you know, when Mike would go out there, when any of us would go out there, the other guys, they don't have to go out there. Yeah. You know, they tune in, they're like, I wonder how Mike's going to deal with that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it helps, though, move that machinery in a way that you say, okay, it only works if, if we work together and we give an answer that's, that's, that's good and that's informative. Well, you know, he makes a very good point about part of, part of the job of being press secretary. I mean, clearly part of the job, or most of the job, is to represent the president and the White House to the press. But the other part of your job is, as he explained, is to represent the press to the White House and the president. And I, I you know, having come out of the press, I've, I felt that particularly. Sir. Hi, my name is Adam Armstrong, and I was just curious. You guys have obviously had um, very uh, exclusive access to uh, to the president. Um, now that you guys are outside of the White House and you guys are reading newspaper clippings, um, is there what do you think the media can be doing to do a better job to uh, to help the uh, serve the general public? Next question. I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. Why not? <laughs> Go ahead, Ron. Well, um, you know, I think journalism has changed. And a lot of, since I was a journalist or since I dealt with journalists, uh, and I went back to journalism after I left the White House, but I think what's happened is, um, you know, when you only had a, a Huntley Brinkley show on NBC and Cronkite on CBS and morning newspapers, they all had like a 6, 6.30 p.m. deadline. So if you're a reporter and you covered a White House briefing and it was over by noon or something like that, you had the whole rest of the afternoon to call up other sources, to do research, to go to the files and so forth. Well, with the internet and with cable television, you don't have that. There's a deadline every minute. And I think that has really uh, changed reporting and the, and the content and depth of reporting. And I think the, the other thing that's changed it when I was at the UPI, where I was before I went mm -hmm. to NBC, we had full-time, we had like two full-time reporters at the Pentagon, two at the State Department, five on the Senate side, five on the House side. We even had full-time reporters at Commerce Department, mm -hmm. Agriculture Department, Justice Department. You stayed on your beat for a long time. You learned all the issues. You became expert on all the issues. You had all these contacts and so forth. So you could really report in depth. Well, as you know, uh, Newspapers are really in a, mm -hmm. in a dive, and um, everybody's a generalist these days. And, and you don't get that depth to the, re to the reporting that you got when you had experts. And as a result, a lot of the reporting doesn't focus on the substance of the issues, but look at the last election. What was the last ele election about? Not the one two weeks ago, or, but I mean the last presidential election. Gaffes gaffes, you know? And well, that's what reporters do because they don't have a lot of expertise these days well, in depth on issues. Well, let me ask Robert, you know, you did, you are the first, this is the first um, social media administration and I'm just curious and, sir, we haven't forgotten you. I'm interested <laughs> in your point of view, but I'm just interested in how 
you yeah. feel this has changed your, your work? Uh, you know, it um, changes it a lot. I mean, obviously, as Ron said, it, the whole thing is sped up in, in a way that is, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody works for the, it's basically everybody's a wire reporter, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you don't, you, your stories don't come out in a newspaper that you get at six in the morning or you might get at the back of the pump, you know, back of the uh, printing place at five in the morning. or so. it's, in, it's all instantaneous. Um, it's sped up things remarkably, both in good ways and in, 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 in bad ways. I, I think, you know, I, I remember I joined Twitter um, and I joined it mostly, you realize it's an amazing communications tool, but also I was watching a presidential press conference uh, in, I hated to do presidential press conferences in the briefing room, um, mostly because it sort of felt like the, that's sort of where reporters and, and, and the press secretary did battle, and it was <laughs> battle, and I thought, don't bring the president in there, have the president go into the East Room or something. But we, we, I must have lost a battle, and we did a press conference in the briefing room, and I'm sitting on this row of chairs on the side, and a, a, a deputy of mine is, is on Twitter, and we're, I'm like, what's that? You know, what do you, he's got an iPad, and he's, and, and so during the press, as the president's giving his answers, all these reporters are tweeting, oh, that's a bad answer, <laughs> or, you know, I don't think he's saying this, or so, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like I'm watching the human bubble box, you know, the, the voice box, it's like, you know, yeah. and I thought, this is ingenious, you know, like I, now I know exactly where everybody's heading every minute of the day because they're tweeting it all out. Yeah. Um, but, it, and you know, digital communications, um, you know, having the uh, weekly radio address now be the weekly TV and radio address. I mean, it's sped things up, it, it, it's, but it's also, I think, knocked down barriers in, in a sense that you really do um, and you can communicate in a way that you truly couldn't before. Some, and, and some argue, though, that this administration has put up more barriers than any of the preceding, except for, let's say, the Nixon administration. There are those who argue there are no more, I mean, I'm not there yeah, every day, I, but there are no, Look, example, every the, White the, House the, is, every White House tries desperately to control the message that comes out every day. And that's not going to change um, anytime soon unless there's the advent of state-run media, uh, which also isn't going to happen anytime soon. Um, I think that you've got, in some ways, a duty to communicate directly with the people. Um, and I think there's also a huge challenge. For instance, 1980, right? So when Marlin was, was sort of that, that administration, Right, 50 million people in a, in a country of about 270 million people watched one of the three evening newscasts. 50 million people. You walk into the East Room, you do your event, 50 million people see it. 310 million people today, and you know how many people are watching those nightly newscasts? A little more than 20 million people. Now there's more information that's more readily available than at any moment in our nation's history. And it's I'm sorry, just, I'm, I'm not people getting, are, I'm not clear on what this has to do with my question, though. I take no, your what point. I'm saying is but that, the question is that yeah. the argument is, and that people who've covered many yeah. of these administrations argue that the Obama yeah. administration has put up more barriers, made more of an effort to control things like pool reports, things yeah. like sprays. I mean, it's well, on the well, one let, hand, there's let's an illusion of spray. Open, I'm just gonna, openness, but I, I that think it doesn't that, really exist. What I'm saying is, I think because the media has become so segmented mm -hmm. that you, you now are speaking in a way that the president puts up a YouTube video. In, in, that reaches 10 million people like 10 million people would watch the newscast. In pool sprays and pool reports, I'll say this about pool reports. Somebody came to me, I won't tell you who the reporter was, pretty early in the administration and said, we're going, to, we're going to redo the pool, and the only people that are going to get pool reports are people that pay to be in the pool. <laughs> so we want you to send out the pool reports to this different list. <laughs> I was like, not happening here. Good luck. And, well, what do you mean? Well, we're doing this. And I said, let me give you a piece of advice. Get an email program to send out your pool reports. And I would say to the White House Correspondents Association, I think it's madness that the White House sends out pool reports. 
buy an email program and send out pull reports. And that whole system is solved. And then you control who gets pull reports. You decide whether you have to pay to be part of the pool. There's no discussion about somebody augmenting the pool report before it goes out. Um, so I you're think saying if a, you put your hands on it, you're going to say what you want to say in it? Is that what no, you're no, saying? No, I'm just saying that, that, that it's remarkable. In that White House briefing room, Mike and all these guys know this, okay. you, you go into that briefing room and the first person at the AP gives you that question. You don't leave that brief, briefing room until somebody in the press corps says thank you. When that lead reporter says thank you, that's a signal to the press secretary that, that basically you've reached the end of what most people would consider a useful briefing. Sometimes it's 30 minutes, sometimes it's an hour and 15 minutes. It's the only room in the White House I think that's not controlled by the White House. Mm -hmm. Reporters control that room. They control, they control in large measure the rules of some of that, okay. of that briefing. I just don't think that if you're distributing pool reports, I, I wouldn't depend on the White House to distribute those pool okay. reports. But I think this thing about this, the White House editing pool patiently. reports is one of the most shocking things. I mean, as a former White House correspondent okay. and as a press secretary, this is supposed to be five or six reporters who represent the whole press corps because they all can't get into an event. So these five or six, they go, they write out what they see and hear, and they give it to the other reporters. Mm -hmm. Now, what role does the White House have in that? Now they've taken that over, and they're editing the pool reports. The next thing you know, they'll go over to the Washington Post and start editing the Post. I mean, this is a shocking development. I'm not making this up. I have a tremendous, this has had a huge impact in, on me. In, in fairness to the White House, and I don't, I don't remember this issue coming up when I was there, but in fairness to the White House, they don't, it's my understanding that the, the Reports are not unilaterally edited by somebody at the White House, that there's a discussion with the reporter about changing. I'm not suggesting it's right or wrong. I'm just I suggesting. I just ever, don't want you to I don't leave the impression anybody, that. When I was at the White House telling me what to put in a pool report ever. I don't remember anybody having two words to say about it ever. Yeah. I don't remember that. Me either. I'm, I mean, yeah. me either. I, again, I think the so, whole thing is solved by the correspondents having their own email other. system that okay. can easily send so, us out. So take the White House out of it. Okay. Mr. Chair, can I? Go, you, the, very, okay, but you all, these are the folks who want to talk to you. Way back when so. the question okay, that got back. asked, the suggestion about what the media could do, I'd make two. One is stop covering the White House as a primarily a political beat. The reporters who are there who are fine reporters mostly cover it as a political story. Is the president up or down? Are polls going up, going down? give us more substance, we the American people can handle more substance. And the second thing was recognize how hard it is for information to get out there to the public. I mean, sometimes news reporters believe, all right, I wrote that story and so it's not news anymore. Well, we know as communicators it's the repetition and coming back to the story and trying to find ways to bring important things back into focus that we try so hard to do. And sometimes we use techniques to try to control that to the advantage of the White House, but it's done with the hope that in this cacophony that's out there, something might break through. And I think the press could probably do a better job of helping at that. All right, sir, we have three more folks who've been very patiently waiting, and I'm hoping we can get all of their questions. Hi, um, my name is Paul Mandelson. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you mentioned that the, the role of the briefing is to shake the truth out of the government, to hold it accountable. I'm wondering if you worry that the revolving door between press secretaries and private news entities is somewhat undermining that, and people are, I don't know, throwing up softball questions, uh, hoping to get a job afterwards. You, I mean, you have Jay Carney, uh, you have Tony Snow, you have you know George Stephanopoulos, um, all going or coming from the private sector news organizations um, after the after their press secretary gig, and I was just wondering if that undermines the credibility of the press secretary the news organization and uh, what you can do about it. Thanks. But, well, let me just say, do, do you think that any of those people got unnecessary softball questions? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess, I, is the press corps in yeah. general, I, and maybe that's not a question for you, but for the press corps, but do you think the press corps in general is more, I guess, soft on I, press secretaries? I, I would say. Yeah, I wish they had been. I yeah. was going to say, I would say, watch the briefing tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> And I guarantee you that you will not come, a, come away with the impression that somehow uh, Josh has been unnecessarily given a huge number of softball questions. I guess they probably won't brief tomorrow because the president's in Asia. But when he comes back, the, you know, the, the, 
if, when he comes back and it's maybe the week where the president might do something on immigration, and you don't have to listen long, listen to the first five questions of the briefing. I, I don't think anybody, um, I think as Mike said, I, there are days in which I would have loved to have picked the person who was going to give me that great softball. Right. Um, but I, I guess the question is, let me rephrase it. Like, for instance, does Jay Carney's previous work at Time Magazine get undermined as soon as he, in his impartial role at Time Magazine as a journalist, get undermined as soon as he takes a political partisan job in the White House as the press secretary? No, because the content and the reporting stands on its own. I mean, if he makes a career adjustment and goes and does that, it's very hard to go back the other direction then. Yeah. And, and, you know, going from being a political person back into the media world is, is strenuous, as Stephanopoulos would say, as my old boss Tim Russert would say, mm -hmm. if he were still here. So that transition is more difficult. I don't think it, but I, I don't think it compromises their prior work as journalists, which has to stand on its own. And, I think and also their subsequent helpful. work. I mean, I would think that the, their subsequent work as journalists has to stand on its own. You, you, that's, that's my take on it. You get to watch these people and you get to decide whether you're, you think they're doing a good job for you. And yeah. the feedback on that is constant, believe me, when I say, <laughs> sir, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, my name is Drew Bailey. I'm a student at American University here in Washington, D.C. Um, I just wanted to know, you guys have had unprecedented access to so many presidents, um, such a wide range of presidents. Uh, if there were there was any one moment that was very memorable that whether it's something they said or did um, that just kind of showed their character um, and that you'll remember for a long time um, if you can share it with us. Hmm. Ron? Well, I, I guess I've already told my two moments. Uh, one was announcing the end of the Vietnam War and the other was uh, um, announcing Betty Ford's uh, hmm. breast cancer. Is there a moment that, I think what he's asking though, is there a moment that perhaps we did not see? Because there's oh. so much, we think we see so much, but actually we see very little. I mean, that's a fair statement, isn't it? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't you say? Is it that, I don't know, Marlon, you told this story in 41 on 41. Do you want to tell that story about when you saw the house at Kenny Bunkport that was, um, I don't know if, if how yeah. you feel about that, but. Um, uh, Let me just, two very quick stories. Mm -hmm. One was President Bush called me to the Oval Office one day and said, I hear the press asking you questions about when am I going to have a meeting with Gorbachev? And he said, this was early in the administration. And, uh, and, and the, they request, the press was getting their normal cantankerous selves and saying things like, uh, you're supposed to be the foreign policy president and you've let six months go by and you haven't met with Gorbachev what's going on. And he said, Tom, so I want you to know this. I'm going to meet with Gorbachev in December, which was four months away. He and I have agreed by telephone. But he doesn't want anybody to know right now because he's got hardliners pressing him in Russia that he's getting too close to America and they don't like it. And I, I've got to do some work there. So can you keep that a secret? And President Bush says, well, we'll try. And Gorbachev says, America keeps no secrets. I'll know about this in days. So Bush said to me, I want you to know, because only Baker, Jim Baker, Secretary of State, and me know about this today. And now you're the third one. If it leaks, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I also want you to know, I listened to your briefings, and I want you to know that you need to come up with language that doesn't deny this is going to happen, or these is arranged, because sooner or later they're going to find out that it has been arranged. And that was a great moment for me, because it said that the president is sensitive to my problems and to the problems of information. Uh, the, other, the other story is when his house burned down, not burned down, when the perfect storm hit New England. And uh, it leveled their house, in effect, just wiped everything out to the ocean. And we went up there the second or third day after it happened. I don't, I don't know exactly how many days, but uh, it was so sad. And the, the press was with us, but they weren't with him in the house. They stayed back out of the way. And, uh, and basically, it was so shocking uh, for him to just walk through the house and everything was gone. All the mementos, all the pictures. He found one little picture of his father in the yard. So what do I do with this? 
and our photographer said, let me have it, I'll try and save it. And that was it. Uh, and we were all in tears, and he started beating this rug. And uh, we thought he's going into shock. And he looked at Andy Card and myself and said, will you help me? We picked up brims, we all started beating this rug. And there was no purpose to it other than we were three people caught up in the, especially the president, in this horrible emotional kind of loss, which, which we see often in hurricanes, tornadoes, floods and stuff across America. But there was really no way for me to explain that to the, to the press. And at, finally at the end, I said, can I bring the press in? He said, I don't want to be here. And he left, went and got in a, went to the shack or somewhere there. And uh, I brought the press over. And they walked through the, the remains of the house and no, got no emotion. Said, OK, almost no story, and walked away. I mean, that was really, that's tough for a press secretary or president to have to go through those kinds of emotional things. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's relevant to what you were trying to find out, but I'm just saying there, those kinds of things happen. Did you, Mike, did you want to add to this before we go on to the next? Well, I mean, what I, what I recall actually was a, a moment that was really important in the Clinton presidency while I was there, where I was absent. And it was, uh, not long after I had started my tenure at the White House, the, I mentioned earlier the federal building in Oklahoma City had been destroyed in a, what turned out to be a domestic terrorism attack. And um, it, we, it was, you know, we had, it happened, we had done all these briefings, all this stuff, but the President, President Clinton went to Oklahoma City to participate in the memorial service. I did not go because it happened that my third child was about to be born. Mm -hmm. And, I, and my wife, who was here, thought it was probably a wise idea for me to stay at home. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember watching. I remember we were in the delivery room, and our, our doctor came in and looked at me and said, are you interested in the fact that your boss is having a press conference right now? And I was, but I <laughs> decided I should probably stay <laughs> where my appointed duties required me to be. But I remember everyone commenting on it. This was a very pivotal moment for Clinton because he had been, you know, he had suffered a lot of political losses in the midterm election. There were questions about, are you still relevant in the process because the Republicans and Newt Gingrich had taken over the Congress? And in that process that a president often has to do of healing and helping a country get through moments of really trauma, he had done an exceptionally good job at that. And I had, I had watched it like every other American watched, watched it on television. But he called, because he, he called to congratulate us on the birth of our son. But I remember just how absolutely tickled he was that he had been able to use the presidency to do something really important to help the people in Oklahoma City, to probably to help himself, I mean, because he understood that he had done a great job. Um, but there are those moments when, you know, they get to kind of with the lights off and the cameras off, they get to kind of stop and sort of assess what it's all about. And I think those are, those are rare. And then you get real insight in, you know, what kind of person they are at those moments. Sir, you're our final question for the evening. Good. Thank I'm you. I'm delighted. Many is the time I've been cut off about this point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my name's Jim Byrne. I've covered this town for oh, some 50 years. Um, and I was at the briefing a year ago last month when the Committee for the Protection of Journalists issued a very, very damning report on the Obama administration's behavior uh, with regard to the press. And some of the top reporters in town were quoted in there. In my opinion, the worst thing he did from the point of view of the press, he promised to veto the Defense Authorization Act of Fiscal 13, which has that section in it permitting uh, our government to arrest any of us anywhere in uh, the United States on suspicion of treason or whatever. Uh, and he, he signed it. And uh, it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court refused to hear it. But in any case, I'm wondering, Mr. Gibbs, uh, you know, you must have read that report. <laughs> and, uh, and then the uh, Defense uh, Authorization Act of Fiscal 13. I mean, my God, he said he was going to veto it, and he I, didn't. I, I don't know what you're referring to. I, I, was, uh, I was out of government at that point, so mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I didn't see that report or, or mention that provision. I, I mean, one of the things that... Um, yeah, I am reminded of a story of um, 
we we were it was pretty early on in the administration. There was um, there were soldier abuse photos that we had to make a decision on, and, and our first decision was to release those photos of uh, I think it was Iraq and Afghanistan, and I remember um, about. A few days after the president made the decision that it was a good thing to, to release those photos, Bob Gates came over to the White House. And I sat in on the meeting, and, 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 and he and Gates talked about it, and Gates made a, I think, what everybody believed was a very persuasive case on not releasing those photos and why that would put people in danger and put soldiers in danger and have the reaction of people even not directed at those that were in the photos, but just overall. And it, we, we talked a little bit about how, you know, sort of knowing too much information. I had been in that meeting, mm -hmm. and we walked out of that meeting, and, and the president had decided, told Secretary Gates, uh, we'll reverse the decision, we won't release the photos. And I don't know if it was that day or about a day later, literally the last question I got in the briefing, I was like half off the podium walking away, and it had been a, we, we'd said we released the photos, but they hadn't been released. And, and somebody just called out, when are the photos going to be released? <laughs> and I remember turning around, and I knew I, I wasn't far enough off to pretend I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, I, I've got to be, like, I, I've got a challenging answer here because I know that they're not going to be released. And I know, I've seen the meeting, I've seen the discussion, I know why. And I, I was very sort of I reminded of, of, of telling the truth slowly. I gave an answer that led everyone to understand we were about to make a very different decision. Um, but I'm, it just reminds me of those times in which, as we talked about at the beginning, you've got information and, and, and what do you do with it when you have it? You're making these decisions about transparency, non-transparency. Some of these, some of the decisions and some of the definitions are, I don't think, as easy as some people might presume. Just transparency writ large, or those some of those decisions writ large. Well, thank you. I don't know that this gentleman is satisfied with that answer. Yeah. But I think that. Uh, I read the report. So. <laughs> but um, we didn't talk. About so many things we could have talked about, including Ron Ness and the fact that you were the first political figure to appear on Saturday Night Live. Um, <laughs> but we'll have to save that for the next session. Ron Nesson, Robert Gibbs, Marlon Fitzwater, Mike McCurry. Thank you. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Always good. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. Thank you. That was fun.